Uh, let's read Psalm 1. We'll give a little bit of uh, introduction as far as the book of Psalms, and then we'll, we'll hit the ground running right here in this passage. Psalm number 1, kind of a, a equivalent, if you can think of it this way, the book of Psalms is basically a songbook. It is a Bible songbook. So when we say Psalm 1, it would be the equivalent of Brother Sam standing up and saying, turn in your songbook to song number 1. And we're going to sing, and that would be how these psalms were laid out. Psalm number 1 was a psalm that was intended to be sung. And singing is something that God has used throughout the ages to help his people remember doctrine and to help his people uh, learn truths that help them in their practical daily walk. And so here we are, Psalm number 1, verse number 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not, see the negative, in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth, negative, in the way of sinners, nor sitteth, negative, in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, positive, is in the law of the Lord, the adult memory verse for tonight, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he, the blessed man, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. Everything you just read, think about the opposite. That's the ungodly. But are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now, you may or may not know this. Some of you, I'm sure, are aware. Maybe others, not so much. But uh, typically, the book of Psalms has been divided into five books. Five books. Now, I'm not sure exactly where this originated, but it's, it's been uh, done this way for quite some time, so it's not something new. But the first division covers the, four, the first 41 Psalms. And I want you to, to, to turn to Psalm 41 with me uh, pretty quickly. And, and go to the last verse. It's kind of interesting how this thing works out. But if you go to Psalm 41, and you go to the last uh, verse of Psalm 41, verse number 13, the Bible says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting. Amen, comma, and amen. So you see how that psalm ends. It, it, it ends with the amen, comma, and Amen. Now, the, the second division covers from Psalm 42 to Psalm 72, and uh, the verse right before the last of that psalm says, it, at the end of it, says, Amen, comma, and Amen. The same thing is true of the third division, which covers from Psalm 73 to Psalm 89. It ends in Amen, comma, and Amen. And that pattern shifts a little bit in, in the fourth division, which goes from Psalm 90 to Psalm 106, which ends in Praise ye the Lord. And so the last division ends also in praise ye the Lord. Now some have divided it up that way and said that it, it relates to the first five books of the Bible. The, uh, the books of Moses and, and they've uh, even uh, tied together the themes of the first division of Psalms with the book of Genesis and the second with Exodus and so on. And of course the, I already noted to you that perhaps the best way to view the book of Psalms is to consider it like a compilation of songs. So uh, Psalm 1 is not necessarily intended to be studied with Psalm 2 as though it's a continuation of a storyline. Uh, the same way with the book of Proverbs, not the whole book of Proverbs, but certain sections of the book of Proverbs. You can study a verse in Proverbs and by the time you get down to the next verse, the subject matter has changed completely. And it's certainly not that way in the book of Psalms, but I don't want you to think that when you read Psalm 1 and then you go into Psalm 2 that it's a continuation of a storyline like the end of 1 Samuel into 2 Samuel. And so it's a song book. Uh, I, I want you to see that they would every passage that we read is something that at some point in the worship of God, God's people would raise their voices and they would sing these songs. Some of them, they would, they would stand and sing about the wicked being judged. You say, well, we should never sing about the wicked being judged. 
Who told you that? Where did you come up with that idea? You say, well, I just feel like, okay, time out. That's not a good gauge. And you say, well, you know, I, I don't like singing songs with so many verses. Boy, you better not be in the temple worship when they sing Psalm 119. Man, you're going to be bored out of your mind when they say, okay, here we go. And they just start to sing in that stuff. I'm just trying to tell you that our minds and hearts have been so shaped by culture and by uh, society and, and, to be honest, by carnal churches that we've lost the reality of what it ought to mean to be a Bible-believing Christian. So when we read Psalm 1 and the other Psalms uh, as well, we're reading songs that they would sing. Some testify of judgment. Some speak of preservation, meaning God's preservation. Uh, some, uh, some will chronicle the prayers of a certain man or of another man. Uh, the, one of the psalmists that we don't think about often is, is the man Moses. There's a, a prayer of Moses, the man of God, in the book of Psalms. Uh, some, uh, some just manifest uh, uh, prayer, meaning they just tell us what that prayer is. Of the 150 psalms, uh, three, uh, or excuse me, 73 are specifically identified in the subtitles as being from, from the pen of David, 73. There are a couple of others that I could show you and will show you as time goes on that they are also by David, but they're, we're not told in the book of Psalms. We're actually told in the New Testament that it came from David. Now, folks will argue over this number, but 62 of the Psalms are unassigned in the book. Now, some will say that number is 49, but, but I, I beg to differ. I think it's uh, 62. 62 uh, psalms in this book, we're not told who they're by. And you, you can say, well, it's got to be by David, but you don't have any proof for that unless you can find a passage somewhere else in your Bible that says so. Now, some psalms, like Psalm 136, we're not going to go there right now, but it, it, it contains what we would call in our singing a refrain or a chorus. Now, you know what that is. That's something that's repeated throughout the song in order to uh, bring it back to your attention in order to drive home a specific truth. Psalm 136 is that. Uh, something along the lines of the mercy, and, uh, 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 the, the mercy of the Lord endureth forever. It's over and over and over again. And the idea is I'm supposed to remember that every time I would sing this line, then I go to the refrain and sing that, and God's helping me remember something. Well, it's not that way in our psalm. But some psalms are that way. Now, in this psalm, we really get a, a view, and, and, and you think about this for a second. There are a whole lot of doctrinal things we could go into, but I'm going to try to keep it more practical this morning. When you read Psalm 1, and many of you have read it, we, I've preached it before here, and, but, but when you read it, you get a view, you get God's perspective, if you will, of the lives of two different men or of two different ways, maybe that's the better way of saying it, you get a, a, a view of varying or of differing ways. Now, I need you to get this. Sometimes in our, in our, in our finite minds, sometimes in our lives, we don't see the difference, but what we're getting in Psalm 1 is a heavenly view to show us the two different paths and where they lead. Sometimes when you're in the moment, you may not see it taking place. You may not see it transpiring, but God sees it taking place, and God can see the end from the beginning, and God allows us a moment in time where he says, let me show you something and show you where this ends up. Now, you see two men, and of course, uh, I, I, I tend to believe verse number four, the ungodly are, so that means it's plural, but let's look at, look at it as though it's an individual. You've got two men in Psalm, uh, Psalm 1. One is the blessed man. Now I find that to be interesting because the, the view is almost, it's, it's not necessarily that the man is necessarily good in and of himself, uh, but it, it, it's focusing in on the fact that God has blessed this man. And that's something for us to take note. You say, well, I, you know, I pray and I read my Bible and I go to church and, and I give to the Lord and I, I do this and I do that. Okay, praise the Lord, but get the focus off of what you're doing and get the focus on the fact that God has been good to you to enable you to do those things. You see the difference there? So when, when I do right, hear me out on this, when I do right, 
the credit goes to who? God. When I do wrong, the blame goes to who? Me. It, now that's the philosophy of Psalm number one. When we talk about the ungodly, uh, the ungodly are to blame for their ungodly behavior, but when we talk about that blessed man, God's the one that gets the glory and the credit. Man, that's a good rule to live by. Listen, this morning in the service, I hope that the Lord will use me. But if something goes wrong, if something's said wrong, if something's done wrong, I get the blame. And I mean that. I'm not, I'm not trying to you know, be super spiritual. That's the reality. But if everything goes well and, and, and the Lord moves in your heart, I don't get the credit. God gets the credit because if I was involved in messing with things, things would get messed up. You realize how beautiful that is? If, 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 if my life comes and goes and it turns out that, that uh, the, the world or my children or my family saw me as a good dad, God gets the credit. Because God did something in my heart to make me a good dad. It's not that I was just a good dad. Does that make sense to you? If I'm a good husband, praise, praise be to the Lord. That's one of the, one of the earliest things that every Christian ought to learn and, and it ought to come from your heart and not be fake or phony. So we see here the blessed man and the ungodly man. Now let's talk a little bit about these two men. In verse number one, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not. So we're going to get a little bit about his uh, associations or disassociations. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now we live in a, in a, t a day and time today where folks see that as unchristian. It is so unchristian that you uh, won't fellowship with the ungodly. Why won't you fellowship with them? That's so unchristian of you and it's unchristlike. No, no, hold on a minute. Uh, this blessed man, he, he, he disassociates with the ungodly, the Bible says. He disassociates with the sinners, the Bible says, and he disassociates with the scornful. Now let's talk about these uh, three for just a moment. The ungodly is the one who is unlike God. That's the idea of ungodly. It's ungodlike. That's what the word means. And so he's ungodlike in his thinking and therefore his actions. He may not always, uh, you may not always see him performing that which he's thinking, but in his mind and his heart, he's corrupt. He is messed up. That's the ungodly. Inside, all these floods of thoughts and feelings and emotions going through there that are just not right. They're ungodlike. Now, the sinner, that's one who actively works out that thinking. I'm not just going to think it. I'm going to do it. And I don't care what you think about it. I've got my way, I've got my mind made up, and I'm going to go the way that I want to go, and it doesn't matter what you think. Listen, the ungodly might still have a little reservation because, listen, there's something in every one of you here that you want to please people, right? There's something in every one of us here. We don't want folks to be disappointed with us. There are things that I might think that might be wrong, but I would never act on them because I don't want to disappoint uh, you, or I don't want to disappoint my wife, or I don't want to disappoint my children. And so I know that that's a horrible thought. I'd better not do that. I don't want to disappoint the Lord. I don't want to disappoint the people in my life. But, but you get to a point if you keep entertaining those thoughts where eventually it doesn't matter what people think anymore. And that's the sinner. And then you see there uh, in that passage the scornful. Now this is not only somebody who thinks ungodly thoughts. This is not just somebody that's acting on those ungodly thoughts. This is somebody that's now ridiculing everybody that does good. That's the progression. And the blessed man, he wants no association with with any of those three people. And let me tell you this. If the blessed man allows himself to be associated with the ungodly and he, and he keeps that association, eventually he's going to have association with the sinner and eventually he's going to be uh, associated with the scornful. It, there's no way around that. You had, listen. If Psalm 1 teaches us anything, it teaches us this we can know a great deal about you by who you hang out with. 
And I'm just telling you that when you begin to break apart from God's people and you begin to draw nigh unto the world and you begin to draw nigh unto the carnal Christians and you begin to draw nigh unto ungodly people, you are telling us all we need to know about you. You're headed the wrong direction. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, it's, it, it may not be fair, but it's right. It is 100% right. Now look at this blessed man. He, he disassociates with those folks, but look what he associates with in verse number two. His delight is what? It's in the law of the Lord. And so what are you going to find him associated with? It's not the ungodly. It's not the sinner. It's, it's not the scornful. He's going to associate and delight. Boy, that word is such a beautiful word. It's, this guy is not just you know, meditating on the law of the Lord because somebody forced him to. He finds delight in the Bible. <clears throat> Can I ask you something? Do you find any delight in the Bible whatsoever? Do you read it as though it's, well, you know, okay, that's kind of boring, and oh, that doesn't really affect me that way, and oh, you know, it's just an archaic book out of date and all that stuff. Listen, you have no clue what you're talking about. This book is the most delightful book that's ever been written. So the blessed man, he's disassociated with these, uh, these people, and he associates with the Word of God. Now, you, you've heard this. This is not new with me. I, I don't know where it originated, but the old saying goes that either sin will keep you from your Bible, or your Bible will keep you from sin. Here we have a man that he says, you know what, I can't spend time with those people and still delight in God's Word. So I've got a choice to make. Can I be blunt with you? You can't spend five to ten hours a day with the news media and still delight in God's Word. You can't do it. You can't spend five to ten hours a day with the world and still delight. At some point, you're going to have to choose your allegiance. Where does your allegiance lie? Listen, if it's the world, you're going to, you're going to have a sad lot. But you, you're going to have to figure that out. I can't figure that out for you. I can't force you. I can't make you go the right way. Now, here we are. The blessed man, he, he disassociates with the ungodly. He disassociates with the sinner. He disassociates with the scornful. But he associates with the word of God. Now, look at verse number four. The Bible says the ungodly are not so. So everything we just read and everything I just said to you, the ungodly is the opposite of that. The ungodly has no trouble being around the ungodly. No, no struggle whatsoever. The ungodly is comfortable with sinners. The ungodly is comfortable with the scornful. Can I say this while we're here? I might as well go ahead and do it. Uh, listen, the, the purpose and the responsibility and the job of, of a New Testament church, this is going to you know, make you feel a little uncomfortable, but, but hear me out. Our purpose is not to make sinners comfortable when they walk through the door. Now, I want them to feel welcome. I want us to be kind to people. I want us to greet people. I want us to say it's so wonderful to have you here. But our purpose, listen, if we, if we said our purpose is to make sinners comfortable, then, then let's start with the song service. We have to change our songs. Because our songs don't make sinners comfortable. So what we've got to do is we've got to give them something they listen to on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And we've got to make them feel a little more comfortable. Now listen, we can put Jesus in the words if we want to, but the beat and the music has to make sinners feel good and comfortable and cozy like they're at home. I don't want sinners to feel like they're at home. Do you understand what I'm saying? I want sinners to know they're in a place where God is going to deal with their hearts and show them the way you're going is not right. If you don't change courses, you're going to die and burn forever. So we're not going to make it comfortable. If we're going to make sinners comfortable, the preaching and the teaching is going to have to change. We're going to have to have pep talks, motivational speeches, now let's look at these paths, okay? We've showed you the two men, the blessed man and the, the ungodly man. 
Well, let's talk about their paths a little bit. In verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His, li his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now this guy, we've already said it, he's separated from the world, but you see the progression here. We've talked about this so much. I don't, I don't want to belabor the point, but the Bible says he walketh. Okay, so you see the progression uh, of walking, of standing, of sitting. The idea is there. This, this man is avoiding getting deeper and deeper into sin by avoiding the first step. Do you, do you understand that? Listen, you know how to not be a drunkard? Never take a sip of alcohol. Does that make sense? You know how not to commit fornication? Keep your distance before you're married. Don't touch, don't kiss. You're going to be pretty safe. You say, well, that's, that's harsh. I'm just trying to tell you that in order to, to avoid the depths of sin, you have to avoid the path that leads to the depths of sin. So the Bible says he walketh not so he's not even going to walk in their counsel. And the Bible says he walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. This would be kind of like the, the follower. Uh, someone gives unscriptural advice and, and the individual lends an ear and takes steps in that direction. Now this guy, he doesn't, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, so he's not even going to start this process. He's not going to stand in the way of sinners. This is somebody participating. I'm no longer just hearing your counsel now I'm going to start walking the path with you. I'm going to stand in your way. I'm going to do what you do. Now this thing progresses. It says, He sitteth not in the seat of the scornful. This is someone that is not only following, not only participating, but now he's corrupting other people. I'm going to just tell you something. I, this is harsh. I, I, I know, and I don't, I don't mean to come across as harsh. I struggle with trust. I, I, I'm, there was a preacher this week at the Bible conference, and I went up to him after he preached. He did a phenomenal job, and I went up to him, and I said, Brother, I just need to apologize to you because I don't know how I come across. And I said, I struggle with trusting people. It's just something that I'm going to probably deal with the rest of my life. And I said, the first time a man preaches, I'm evaluating. Now, the, the word is probably judging, critiquing. And I said, I'm sorry for that. And I said, but... It takes me about five to ten times of hearing a man preach before I actually start developing a little bit of trust for that guy. And I said, I, I just wanted to tell you all this, not that any of this matters to you, but, but now that I've heard you preach several times, I just wanted to say that was a real blessing. I appreciated it, and I thank the Lord for using you and, 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 and encouraging you to preach His Word. And so I was trying to be an encouragement. But, but listen, I have learned that it is hard to find people, good people, who have right motives who you can really trust in life. How many of you would agree to that? You, 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 it's hard to find people you can trust. I've learned that sometimes people sitting next to you in pews are not quite as trustworthy as they come across when they're sitting there next to you. I've learned that you have to be careful because you never know whether you're getting ready to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, even in a church service. It could be in a men's restroom. It could be in a ladies' restroom where, or in the nursery or uh, in a Sunday school class or in, in a youth meeting or in a, it just uh, in a handshaking time or just out in the vestibule here or walking up to your car. You never know when you're going to be hit with some advice or some counsel that's not of God. It's, it's straight from the pits of hell, but it came from the mouth of a Bible-believing Christian. And you've got to be careful not to walk in that. You've got to be careful not to progress the next step and stand in the way. You've got to be careful not to progress the next step and sit in the seat of the scornful. And so we see that he, he separates himself. He separates himself not only from some things, but unto the Lord. He, he delights in the law. But think about this. He meditates in the law day and night. Meditating is not, you know, this, uh, you know, fold your fingers, mm, you know, that kind of thing. It's not the absence of thinking. It is actually the presence of thinking. You're thinking about God's word and you're going back over those verses again and again. Now it's hard to meditate on something you never read. 
So if you're not reading the Bible, you will not meditate on the Bible. But if you're reading the Bible, you're actually giving your mind some content to go over and over and over and over. It's like chewing on it over and over and over again. That's the way it ought to be. Now this man's uh, like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But then there's this other one. Verse number four, the ungodly are not so. Everything said about that godly or that blessed man is not so about the ungodly. Can I, can I say this to you? If you are not reading the Bible, and therefore you're not meditating on the Bible, and therefore you're not delighting in the Bible, you're already telling on yourself that maybe you're not on the right path. And listen, the more you're in your Bible, the more difficult it gets to be around those who are ungodly. The less time you spend in your Bible, the more you start to justify everybody. Listen, we live in a society today where the, the world, the flesh, the devil, the media, all this stuff, everybody's promoting ungodly behavior, even in churches, promoting it, encouraging it, talking positively about it. That only happens when a nation puts down its Bibles. Now let's talk about their ends, and, I, and I'll be done this morning. Two men traveling two paths, and their ends are quite a bit different. Now in verse number four, the Bible says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. They're, they're just, they're gone, blown away. Verse number five says, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand... In the judgment. And it's, you know what's kind of wild? The ungodly are standing in the way of sinners now. But one day they will not stand in the judgment. Do you see the shift? And the Bible says, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Right now, so, so here's the thing. Look, you don't need to stand in the way of sinners because one day God's going to make sure that the sinners are not standing in the congregation of the righteous. Can I just say, your, your best friends ought to be your, your spouse and your family anyway, but beyond that, it ought to be saved people who love the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, you know, but, but we've been good friends forever. Listen, most of the people that I was friends with growing up, we're not friends anymore. You say, well, are you trying to separate from them? Not necessarily, but Jesus Christ has separated us. Because the things that they would want to talk about, I've got one friend, he was a, a, a good friend. We used to play quite a bit of basketball together. Uh, he's been arrested several times. How, how in the world can he and I be good friends? We don't run the same places. We don't do the same. I don't want his language. He doesn't want my language. I don't want his music. He doesn't want mine. I don't want what he believes. He doesn't want what I believe. It's, it's a separation. But the Bible says the ungodly. There's coming a time when the ungodly not, will not stand in judgment and the sinners will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. Listen, one of these days, the righteous are going to congregate. And I'm not talking, I, I think you could apply this to here and now, but I think it's a forward look. There is coming a day and time where the righteous are all going to congregate together. And the Bible says the sinners will not be there. The sinners are not going to participate in that final, final congregating of the righteous. Now you say, well, that's, you know, that's sad. God told man that if you go the way of the transgressor, it's hard and he says, there is a way that seemeth right unto men, but the end thereof is death. Now, if you look here, verse number six, the Bible says this at the end of the verse. It says, the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now, you know what that means because of your New Testament. One of these days, uh, if, if, if an unsaved man dies today, he immediately, his soul immediately goes to hell. But, but hell, hear me out on this, hell is a holding place that's temporary. Eventually, hell is going to be delivered up and it's going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. So every sinner that dies without Christ is going to die and go to hell and then one day be brought up to only to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. 
The Bible says at the end of that great white throne judgment, the, the verdict is that those sinners are cast into the lake of fire, which burneth forever and ever. Listen, there's no end. They are going to perish every moment of every day without ever burning up or ceasing to exist. That's the ungodly. You say, well, you know, I just want to have a good time with my friends, and I just want to party. Listen, if you choose to reject Jesus Christ and the salvation that he offers, you need to understand your party is going to end abruptly. And forever is a long time to burn. I don't know exactly, I think I've said this, I don't know whether it was here or somewhere else, but a lake of fire, I, I have to be a literalist in this because I have nothing else no reason not to be. It seems to be a, a lake that's fire. And it's almost as though you're trying to, uh, there's no bottom to this thing. You can't just stand there and keep your head above the fire. It is just a, an ongoing, can you imagine drowning every second, but never able to perish, never able to die and cease to exist. And it's not just the drowning, but it's not drowning in water. This is drowning in fire, a lake of fire. That's the end of the ungodly. Now, it may seem fun, it may seem cool, it may seem like the way to be, you know, the happening thing today, but there's coming a day and time where it won't be the happening thing. And see, the problem is, you can't make those decisions later. You have to choose now whether you're going to trust Jesus Christ as Savior or whether you're going to reject Him. Now, let's read about the other man here and his end. Verse number five, I, I, I like this. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I can convey just the, the greatness of this. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. One of these days, the righteous are all going to get together. Right now, we struggle to get along. God's people, saved people, struggle to get along. Sometimes we got little bitty petty things. Listen, Sometimes, I don't, know, I don't know why this is. We either, we go to one extreme or the other. We, we divide over everything or we divide over nothing. I don't, know, I don't know why we're that way. But you know something? There are some folks that have doctrine a little different than mine. But they're saved. They love the Lord. And one of these days, now today we couldn't. I mean, listen, y'all have no idea how much underlying baggage there is in the ministry. You have no idea. There are times where uh, you'll have somebody preach and they'll say, well, now I can't preach at that meeting because such and such is preaching. So we're not just going to separate from the person. We're going to like hyper. I mean, well, do, are you friends with that guy? Well, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I think he's a good brother. Well, then I can't be friends with you. Okay, fine, whatever. But there's going to come a time when all the saved will be able to congregate and better than that, we're going to get along while we're congregating. And then when we congregate, the focus won't be on my differences from you or your differences from me. Our focus will be on the lamb that was slain. And that makes all the difference. But not only shall we congregate, and I'm looking forward to that congregation. There's some folks uh, with the Lord right now I want to see. There's some folks there right now I can't wait to congregate again with one more time. Can't wait. The Bible says this in, in verse number six. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. And I thought about that. How is he? It's, he's familiar with it. He knows it. He understands it. He comprehends it. You know how? Now this is fast forwarding, okay? This is after Psalm 1. But Jesus Christ, God's son, came into this world and he took on him a body of flesh just like us. He became a servant. And Jesus Christ lived a sinless, perfect, spotless life. He knows the way. Now you know what the Bible says to us, John 14, 6. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but how? By me, Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do I walk that way today? I'm not saying David understood this or whoever wrote Psalm number 1. But I'm telling you this, fast forwarding to today, the way is to get in Jesus Christ, to be accepted in Him. If you're here this morning and you've never put your faith in the finished work, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you've never put your faith in what Jesus Christ did for you, 
you are not saved. You are dead in trespasses and sins. And if you, when you die physically, your soul will go to hell and your soul will eventually be delivered over into the lake of fire. You had better not play around with this thing. You had better put your faith in Jesus Christ and you better do it now. Now's the time. Now's the acceptable time to be saved to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ.